Okay, welcome to College Algebra. So there's an exam in five, five days, I think. Okay, so I sent out instructions this morning concerning it. Uh, are there any questions concerning the instructions? So any questions before we continue going over new things? Yes? Uh, I have a question about online homework. Okay. So the question is uh, f of x. So this is a question from the online homework. Yes. Okay. Or about the online homework. Okay. So f of x equals 1 over x. And we solve for b. Solve for what? B? And the, the domain is 2 comma B. We have, we're given a bracket 2 comma B. Like so? And um, something, I think F of X is negative 1 over 14. Something's not right. <laughs> I haven't been given enough information. So just using my imagination, it might have been something like, it might have been something like, suppose that the average rate of change of f of x on the interval 2 to b is one, negative 1 over 14. Solve for b. Okay, solve for, solve for b, and this is given that the average rate of change of f of x on 2 to b is negative 1 over 14, like so. OK. So what is the, f what is the formula for average rate of change? The change in y over Right. So then <clears throat> the formula is, so average rate of change of say a different function, so how about g on a different interval s to t is g of t minus g of s divided by t minus s. So notice that the t's line up and the s's line up. So, so what, so this is this is just a reminder of, of things, of, of presumed knowledge, okay? So then now, this, what this exercise is asking about, it's saying that suppose that you know the average rate of change. Suppose that that's known, but you don't know the interval. Then the question is, is well, tell me the interval so that this function will have that average rate of change. So in the end, what you're requested to solve is the following. So you have to solve f of b minus f of 2 divided by b minus 2. That's the average rate of change on the, on the unknown interval. But the average rate of change is, pre is prescribed for you as what? Negative 1 over 14. Yes. So you have to solve this equation for b. Uh, 14, yeah, thanks. So you have to solve this for b. So where's the one where x? Because this would be, what is f of b? 1 over b. And what's f of 2? 1 over 2. Well, from here, from here, you have to be able to take it for yourself. But it would be 1 over b minus 1 over 2 over b minus 2 equal to negative 1 over 14. So this is now just an equation that you must solve. So, so um, that's fine. And then for visual folks, 
So when I do this, I mean, this is, you know, not ac actually not at all how I think about this problem. Uh, but just as an, another point of view to look at this, is that that function 1 over x, that function 1 over x looks like this. And you know that because 1 over x is one of the functions that you're supposed to know. Okay, so then now, what's happening is, is that on this interval, 2 to b, that's two attachment points on this, on this function. One of them is here, attached here at 2. And the other one we're saying needs to be attached over here at b. And then how, how is average rate of change related to these two points? That's what we talked about last time. The secant, right? So then it's, it's the two, it's, you connect these. And so what this question is asking, sort of conceptually, it's saying that, okay, the B fence post, the B fence post is, is movable. So if you could move it, you'd watch that point wiggle back and forth, and you'd see the secant line wiggle also. So you're allowed to move this one around. And what you're requested to do, what you're requested to do is move this B fence post into the position so that this secant line has slope negative 114, one, 1 over 14, negative 1 over 14. So move this until the slope of this is that. So in my head, this is how the problem works. <laughs> so move this one around. <clears throat> so would it be like negative b plus 2 over 14 plus 1 half equals 1 over b? So you, from this equation, you'd multiply both sides by b minus 2 mm -hmm. and then solve for b. And that, off the top of my head, I have no idea what the answer is going to be. But now that, now that we have an equation in principle, you, you could do it. Other questions? Yes? Um, there was just like on the homework we turned in, but there was like one, and it, was, it gave us like a function, um, and then it like said like the square root of it. Like what would it look like in terms of the domain range? Domain and range, yeah. yeah. Okay, so something, so for, for that written homework, you, we turned it in today, I think? So I'll post the video key to it tonight. Okay. So you'll be able to look at it there. Okay, but if you have, after looking at the PDF and video key, if you have further questions, please do ask them. Should the quiz five be in the grade book? Yes, no, no, not quiz five. Oh. Quiz five, quiz, quizzes four. zero through four are in the grade book. <coughs> quiz five is presently in the hands of a grader, and they've been told to do this post haste, and it will be put into the grade book as soon as possible. Quiz six will not, is on the final, uh, is on the midterm exam. But it's not, it won't be graded by the time okay, the, of the exam. However, all of the written homeworks which correspond to quiz six uh, are graded and the keys for them are posted. So you can look at all, all of those. And then I'll post the keys for quiz six <coughs> Saturday night. So there's videos of homeworks from last week up? Yes, I think so. Yeah, they should all be up. It, yes, it is. On, okay. There's a link to it there. I, I post that link. That link is posted in places. many places. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Other questions? So a, as for the exam, okay, there, there's a key, both PDF and video, for every, everything that, every question I've asked <laughs> that will be on the, and a similar question to all of those will be on the exam. So the optimal strategy is to be as familiar as possible with all of those. 
Other questions? Okay, so last time we ended talking about increasing and decreasing. Okay, so then here's another topic we need to be familiar with. So definition one. So I'll say let, uh, no, I, I don't need to say that. So just one. Uh, the absolute minimum of F is a point C comma F of C such that uh, such that F of C is less or equal to f of x for all x in f's domain. So what this is saying is that if we have a function, then the absolute minimum of the function, if you had a drawing of it, say, would be the point which is lowest. This, this output, f of c, is less or equal to every other output. Okay? What do you think is the next thing I'm going to define? Absolute maximum. Absolute maximum. Of f is a point c, f of c, <coughs> such that f of c is now greater or equal to f of x for all x in f's domain. Okay, so then let's have an example. So I'll say that this is function f. OK, now I'm going to ask several questions about it. So what is the domain of f? What is the range of f? Uh, where is f increasing? Where is f decreasing? Uh, the absolute min of f and the absolute max of f. So I'll give you a second to catch that. I cheat by having those little little things. If you go to the notes page, if, if you just were really interested, if you go to the notes page in a, in a folder that's right near the notes page, I, ha I have a PDF of these. And what I do is I just print these off, and then I cut, I, and then I cut them into these little things, and I bring them to class. <laughs> With, with tape. On the notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so where, where, the, where the class notes are, if you go up one directory, then you'll see another one that says, another directory that says, I don't know what. 
Okay, so how do you how do you figure out the domain? Sweep left and right. Okay, so then back here with this vertical line, I'm not touching the plot. So back so these x values are not in the domain. So the first place we're in the domain is there, and that's x is negative five. So then we sweep, so from negative five all the way to three. Okay? So any question about that being the domain? Okay, how do we um, find the range? Very good, you sweep bottom to top. So then now, the lowest point is three, negative. Ne negative three, thank you, and the highest point is positive three. Okay, how about where is F increasing? So negative five to negative three. And then union, one to three. Okay, how about where's F decreasing? Very good, Gesundheit. <laughs> so remember that increasing and decreasing are always reckoned left to right. It, where they, they're reckoned in the, direct, in the direction in which the input is increasing. So input always increases to the right. So you might get here and say, well, if I'm here and I move to the left, then I'm going up. So I'm increasing. What's wrong with that, with that reasoning? And you're not going yeah, so it's increasing or decreasing is always reckoned moving to the right. So so, when you're here and you move to the right, you're going down. So this, this region of the function is decreasing. Okay, absolute min. Okay, so it has to be a point. Uh, negative, five, negative, three. negative five, negative three. So the absolute minimum occurs at input negative five and produces output negative three. So, and that's a point. So it's an, it, it is an unfortunate coincidence of history that this notation that we use to write a point is also the notation that we use to write an interval. That's, that's an, just an unfortunate coincidence of history. So usually, if there's, a, if there's a chance for ambiguity, I always try to do something like this so that you understand this is a point. Okay, how about what's the absolute maximum? Very good, it occurs twice. So it occurs once at negative input three with output three, and it occurs again at input three, output three. So in principle, the absolute maximum could occur any number of times. And the, ap and the absolute minimum can occur any number of times. So any question about this? So that makes it not one to one. Right? It it is not one to one. Yeah. So th this this alone would mean it's not one to one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Good observation. Other questions? Yes. Um, could you explain the f the uh, f decreasing again, please? Yes. So so what a function is said to be increasing on an interval when it is the case that every time on that interval you move to the right, you move up. So consider, consider being at this point on the function, and we want to move right. So I want to move my, my pointer to the right. But I have to do, in doing so, I have to stay on the red. So I, this, is not a, this is not a legal move, because I moved off of the function, right? So if I want to move my pointer to the right, I must also be moving up. So, so on this interval, on the interval from negative five to negative three, every time I move to the right, I move up. So the function is increasing there. Now notice in this region, the opposite is true. It's sti we're still moving to the right, and I still have to stay on the red, but now notice that every time I move to the right, I'm going down. 
So the function is decreasing in this region. Other questions? OK. <coughs> so the next thing now is section 3.4, which is called something like operations on functions. So now one thing that's very useful about numbers. So this, func this section is about functions, but right now I'm going to talk about numbers for just a minute. One very useful thing about numbers is that given two numbers, you can combine them in a variety of ways to make a new number. So for example, if I give you numbers A and B, you can produce a third number by adding them. Right? And you can produce maybe even a different number by subtracting them. And you can produce a new number by multiplying them. And almost always, you can produce a new number by dividing them. Why do I have to say almost always? Be well, because, OK, because not always. So why not always? Could you get an undefined number? In what, in what circumstance could division be undefined? If the denominator is 0. If the denominator is 0, right? So, so human beings love systems in which this is the case, right? Take two numbers, combine them, a new number. Two cats, cats, kitties, combine them, more cats. Right? Terrific, terrific system. It'd be really weird, okay, if you combined cats and then a got a dog or a banana or whatever else, <laughs> besides, besides a cat. Okay, so here we go. So suppose that we have the following. Let f be a function with domain d sub f and g a function with domain d sub g. So f with its with its domain and g with its domain. So we're going to define four operations. So the first operation we'll define is plus. So the new function f plus g is defined in the following way. So f plus g evaluated at x is defined as f of x plus g of x. So to, def to define the sum function, you evaluate the first one, you evaluate the second one, and then you add the results together. Okay, now most students, at, at least maybe if this is not the first time you've taken college algebra, maybe you took something like this in secondary school, omit the next part in their mind. The next part is very important. So with domain, well, let's think about this for a minute. So we want to evaluate the sum function at x. So that means we need to evaluate both of these. So because of this, where does x need to be? Because of, because of just that term right there. Where does x need to be? It needs to be in f's domain, right? You couldn't evaluate this part if x was not in f's domain. How about this? It must also be in G's domain. So this is saying that X must be in F's domain and also G's domain. So this, yes. So this one is saying that X must be in DF. And this one is saying that X must be in DG. And these together are saying that the domain is the intersection. So that's just to say that if, if you want to evaluate the sum, then you have to be able to evaluate both of them. Okay. <laughs> So besides that, we can also do subtraction. So it is denoted as f minus g. 
It is defined in the following way. F subtract G evaluated at X is defined as F evaluated at X minus G evaluated at X. So what's the domain? What's going to be the domain? <clears throat> it's, it's the same as before. DF intersect DG for the same reasons. right? Because to evaluate this, you need to be able to evaluate F and also G. So once you've evaluated both of them, that's enough. So DF intersect DG. OK. Another thing we can do is product. This is denoted with a solid dot. And I'm saying that that's a solid dot. And I'm emphasizing that it's a solid dot. And if you don't know why I'm saying that, then don't worry. You'll find out in 10 minutes. So it is denoted as f solid dot g. So f solid dot g evaluated at x is defined as f of x multiplied by g of x. And what's the domain? So what will the domain be? The same, for the same reasons. Because to evaluate this product, this means you need to be able to evaluate F. This means you need to be able to evaluate G. So you need to be able to evaluate both of them. OK. What's the last operation you think I'm going to mention? Division. So it is denoted like this, or it can be denoted like this. Either way, it's fine. It is defined in this way. F divide G evaluated at X is F evaluated at X divided by G evaluated at X. What's the domain? Not the same. It's not union. Ah, right? So notice that the, the numerator is saying x must be in f's domain. The denominator is saying that x must be in g's domain. So it must be in both. So at the least, at the least, x needs to be in the intersection. But what else could possibly go wrong? G could be 0. So now it's, you're in the intersection, but also in the part of the intersection where g isn't 0. df intersect dg intersect the part where g of x is not 0. OK, so let's have an example. Do an analytic example first. Suppose that f of x is um, 3x minus 2, and this is on the interval um, negative 3 to uh, 17, and that g of x is 2x plus 5, and this is on the interval negative 8 to um, 12, like so. And say that I define h is f product g. I want you to do two things. I want you to find an expression and a domain for h. H. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Okay. So, h evaluated at x, well, that's by definition f evaluated at x multiplied by g evaluated at x. Right? That's the definition. So now I want you to simplify this as much as possible. So h of x is, well, that would be 3x minus 2 multiplied by 2x plus 5. And so you could um, foil that out and collect like terms and everything else. So I'll do that quickly since that's not the thing I want to emphasize. So that would be 6x squared and then plus 15x minus 4x is 11x and then minus 10. So that's an expression for h. Okay, so have I answered everything in the exercise? No, I need to find the domain. <coughs> so what is the domain of H? Right. So the domain, because this is product, product of F and G, that means that X needs to be in F's domain and also in G's domain. So that is to say that the domain will be negative 3 to 17 intersect negative 8 to 12. And two weeks ago or three weeks ago, or I don't remember how many weeks ago, we went over how to compute the intersection of intervals. So we've got a lot to do today. So I'm just going to say that the answer is negative 3 to 12. But you can if you can see, if you can just see that, that's great. But if you need a more concrete way to compute it, you can look back in the notes or the videos. Okay. So any question about this? I, I have a question. So how about, uh, how about this function, f? Is it defined at negative 7? Well, why not? I mean, 3 times negative 7, that's negative 21, and then minus 2, that's negative 23. Ah, but negative 7 is not in the domain. It's not in there. So is f defined at negative 7? No, it is not. It isn't. Now, it's a different, it's a different thing to ask, is it in principle possible to evaluate 3x minus 2 at negative 7? Sure it is. Sure it is, but not this function, not f, because that's f's domain. Similarly, here's h, and what we're saying is that its domain is negative 3 to 12. So is, is it in principle possible to plug in 100 into 6x squared plus 11x minus 10? Sure it is, but you can't plug 100 into h. That's not defined. Okay? So. The, the reason for the confusion is that functions always come with two bits, a, a rule for evaluating them and the place where you're allowed to d use that rule. So here's a rule. This rule can be evaluated in principle at any point. But H's domain is this, which means that you're only allowed to perform that evaluation here. And 100's not in here. Okay, good. <coughs> So different question. So how about, what if I give you one, two, three, four, five, eight, negative 10, uh, 12, and I also give you I also give you 2, 3, 4, 5, and other crazy numbers, 6, 7, negative 10, <laughs> not that crazy, right? <laughs> okay, and then uh, 4. Okay, so now 
I'm going to make a rule here. So that one to that one, that one to that one. So I'll say that this rule, this one is F, and this one is G. OK. So now some questions about, about this. What is the domain of F? What is the domain of G? What is the domain? of uh, F plus G. No, they're not all the same. <laughs> yeah, one, two, three, and four. So the domain of F is one, two, three, and 4. It's not the interval from 1 to 4 because there's no definition for 1 and a half, for example. Okay. What's the domain of G? 2, 3, 4, 5. And what's the domain for the sum function? 2, 3, and 4. Why is the domain for the sum function 2, 3, and 4? Yeah, that's the intersection of these. It's what's in both. Is 1 in both? It's not in the domain. Is 2 in both? It is in the domain. Is 3 in both? Yes. Is 4 in both? Yes. Is 5 in both? No. No. So the domain is this. So then now I could ask a different sequence of questions. I could say, OK, how about? What is F evaluated at 3? It's 5. Because you go to F's domain at 3, and then you follow the arrow to 5. OK, so it's 5. So that means that if you provide input 3 to F, it will produce for you output 5. And how about what is G evaluated at um, 2? 6, for similar reasons. Okay. How about what is F plus G evaluated at 2? So it can only be 1, right? How many outputs is a function allowed to have? Just 1. Or it has to be in the five and a half. It has to be in the domain. It is. Is 2 in the domain of the sum function? Well, according to the definition, this would be f of 2 plus g of 2, right? That's what the definition is. So what's f of 2? It's t negative 10. <laughs> right? That's a, it, may, it may be hard for you to see it, but that's a green arrow going to negative 10. And then what is g evaluated at 2? 6. So the answer is negative 4. Okay. How about how about what is f quotient g evaluated at three? Well, okay. So the the definition would be f evaluated at three divided by g evaluated at three. Okay. That's the definition. And so that would be, well, the numerator would be uh, 5 divided by negative 10. 
Okay, and this is negative half. Okay. <clears throat> so any question about this? So this is a lot of chasing arrows and things like that. So any questions about this? Okay. <clears throat> How about from a different point of view? Okay, so I'll say that this is function f in red. I'll make a new function, another function. And this is function g. OK. So now, let's answer these quickly. So what's the domain of f? What's the domain of g? And what's the domain of f plus g? Good. So negative 5 to 1. OK. Uh, for g, it's negative 3 to positive 4. OK, so this is, we asked a question almost just like that on the first page, or second page, or something like that. But now here's a slightly different question. What's the domain of the sum function? So I have a question. So is, is x equal to 4? Is input 4 part of the domain of the sum function? No. Well, why not? I see a point right there. Right. So I've got a green point there, but I get, I'm, I'm taking your complaint to be that I don't also have a red one. OK, what about, what about this x value? Is this x value in the in this domain of the sum? Why not? Right. So visually, the intersection thing that we were previously talking about. Now, visually, you can express it in the following way, is this input, this, this input has a green output. That's good. But there's no red output. That's bad. Okay. This one has a, this input has a red output, but no green, uh, sorry, a red input. What am I saying? This input has a red output, but no green output. So the domain is everywhere you have a red and a green. So now the rule, you could think of it like, OK, we're going to sweep, and we want to know everywhere we have red and green. So that's the first place we have red and green. And then we continue to have red and green for a while. Stop. OK? Over here, just green. Over here, nothing at all. Over here, nothing at all. In here, you have red and green. So that would be negative uh, 3 to 1. And of course, of course, that's the intersection of these two. OK. So now, how about, so now that you've done that bit, please evaluate. What is f plus g evaluated at negative 1? OK, let's see why. So according to the definition, according to the definition, that would be f evaluated at negative 1 plus g evaluated at negative 1. That's the definition. So now how do we figure out what f evaluated at negative 1 is? 
Right. You go to the red function because that's f. You provide it with input 1. It gives you that point, which is that output, uh, sorry, input negative 1, output positive 1. Okay. So this would be 1, and then plus, what is g evaluated at negative 1? Negative 3, because at, at input negative 1, we have green output negative 3. So what is the output of the sum? Negative 2. OK. Any question about this one? Now, so functions in their way are very similar to numbers in that you can add numbers, you can add functions. You can multiply numbers, you can multiply functions. But there's something you can do with functions that, that ha numbers have no analog for. Okay, and that's the next operation, and it's composition. So let f and g be functions. Then f and open circle g. So this is a new function. So just like f plus g is a new function and f divide g is a new function, f open circle g is a new function. It is defined in the following way, f open circle g evaluated at x is f evaluated at g of x. Okay, now, if you, took a, if you took this in secondary school, um, your instructor might have called this fog or something. That is the first and last time I will ever say that. <laughs> okay, because that's not an O, it's a circle. Okay, and, and I pronounce, I, I, I encourage your high school instructor to pronounce that. What is that? Foot, foot, I don't, I wouldn't even know what. The plus looks like a T, I don't know. So now there's, this is pronounced F composed with G. Uh, however, young, youngish mathematicians, and I'm, I, I meet that criteria, very often don't pronounce this as composed. They call it circ. Because when you typeset this, the command to typeset the circle is circ. So F circ. F circ G. OK, so this is, what this means is that you, you take g, you give it input x, it produces an output. And then you take that output of g and you provide it as input to f. So this is like an assembly line in which there's multiple steps. Right? So then, quick example in the moments we have remaining. So now we have two rules, and they're one after the other. So if I call this rule f and this rule g, then I could ask the following. I could say, well, what is g evaluated at 1? Three. It's 3. That's because this is g's domain. So you take 1, and the rule for that is that it goes to 3. So g evaluated at 1 is 3. I could ask, well, what is f evaluated at 10? Maybe 6, because here's f's domain. Here's f's domain. You trace 
from 10 to 6. But now I can ask this question. I can say, well, what is F circ G evaluated at, uh, say, 3? It'll be 8, because now what you're doing is you're starting here, and you trace it all the way to the end, right? 3 goes to 12, which goes to 8. So you can see this computationally in this way. This would be F evaluated at G of 3. Well, what's G of 3? Negative 12. So this would be F evaluated at negative 12. And then what's F evaluated at negative 12? 8. So now, this, this composition is the single most, is the single biggest reason that functions are what are studied in mathematics. Because we want to be able to compose things in steps, just like an assembly line. We'll talk more about that on Friday.